Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Helen Sedwick. Hi Helen. Hi there. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. So just as a little introduction, Helen is a California attorney with 30 years experience representing a diverse range of businesses and entrepreneurs. She writes historical fiction and has also written the self-publisher's legal handbook to help writers self-publish while minimizing legal risk. Now I get questions every day, I reckon, about legal stuff. So Helen, just start by telling us a bit more about you and how you came to write fiction and self-publish when you're in this legal world. Well, I actually, after in college, I studied creative writing and worked in advertising for a few years and wrote on the side. And then after being tired of being broke, I went to law school. And I think that is true of many people who try writing. We we're also good students and bookish and we go, I went to law school and always continue to write on the side. 30 years later and two children later, I now have more time for writing. A year and a half ago, I self-published my historical novel, Coyote Wins. And when I self-published that, I learned that there wasn't a legal guide to help self-publishers with all the various issues that they face. And I wanted to write that guide to help people out. Mm. Which, which is fantastic, as I said, I think, you know, the rest of us are not lawyers and you do bring this, you know, and I, I te my attitude is to tend to not to worry about it very much, but there are quite a lot of questions. So let, let's go through some of the common legal questions that, that come up um, in the book. Let's start with copyright, um, because some people are very confused about copyright. Um, what is copyright and what do authors sell if they sign with a traditional publisher? A copyright is a piece of property, just like your house or your car or your bicycle. And it exists as soon as you capture your idea in writing. So uh, you don't have to register it. You don't have to publish it. You don't have to correct the typos in it. You own the copyright as soon as you put it into writing or affix it into a piece of paper or a computer hard drive. Uh, it's always good to take the extra step of registering the copyright, but we can talk about that separately. Uh, when you are publishing it, whether you're traditionally publishing it or going through a yourself publishing it, think of your copyright as being a large house with a lot of rooms in it. And you are the landlord and you are basically letting out a few of the rooms. Some of them are one of them is print, one is ebook, one's audiobook, one's the French translation, the Czechoslovakian translation. There's all these are different rooms. Some of those rooms you may give exclusively. Only one person can enter that room. Let's say your publisher. Some may be like hallways and it's non-exclusive. Many people can use it. And when you're doing self-publishing, you want to make sure your contracts are all non-exclusive. That you can print your books with CreateSpace and Ingram Spark, or you can uh, do, have various options. So that's the way to think of copyright as being you have pieces of rights, you have rooms in this building that you are going to let people use. Well, that's a fantastic metaphor. And of course, like one of my worst examples is a friend of mine in New Zealand who sold world English rights uh, to all formats, ebook, print, audio, everything. And I was like, ah, that you've just basically sold most of your house, right? What you should do is try and sell the least number of rooms in your house. Uh, absolutely. First, only the amount of time that's useful and what when do you get it back? Many, many people are intimidated by contracts. I joke that they think they look like 5,000 words run through a blender. <laughs> So uh, in my book, I take specific sections of contracts and I say, this, this is what the contract says and this is what it means. Um, and writers can learn how to read the key provisions of the contract to find the kind of gotchas that your friend got. You know, it's looking at the grant of rights and, the ter and termination, like how do you get out of this deal if it's bad? 
if you learn how to read those two provisions, you're going to save yourself probably 95% of the time from making a bad mistake. And writers, if you can structure a novel, writers can learn how to read those two provisions of the contract. Yeah, sorry. Just, and it's, like, I've taken it on myself to teach them. <laughs> yeah, just go into those two uh, clauses a bit more. Just explain what are those two clauses and why don't we like them? Uh, when you are granting rights, you are selling somebody something. So you want to make it very clear what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, and how you are compensated for your property. And part of this is I think writers tend to be shy about being salespeople. And that doesn't work to your benefit. Uh, you have to be a bit more tough than that. So what you want to look for is if you are granting exclusive rights to anybody, uh, you want to limit those to the rights that that publisher or distributor can actually, actually exploit is the word. Get out there and make money for both of you. If it's an ebook publisher and they want print rights, worldwide print rights in every language, uh, in all formats, that's ridiculous. They can't use them to your advantage or to their advantage. And there are contracts out there that say that. And it's only an ebook distributor. So you want to only give exclusive rights to somebody who can actually make use of them. And in every other circumstance, it's non-exclusive rights, meaning that you can, you can sell through various channels at the same time. Mm. And um, the end, and then the other clause is how it ends, right? Yes. If it's a traditional publishing contract, uh, that's a highly negotiated item. It usually has to do with what your sales have been. If your sales, if they take you out of print and defining what take you out of print means, then after a time you should be able to get your rights back. And this is so individualized. Uh, if, you, if it's a traditional public publishing contract, which is usually an exclusive one, then it's worth hiring an attorney because the it's such an individual one on, one by one case that you really need somebody to look at that contract. If it's self publishing contract, then you want the contract to be terminable, but on notice, like five days notice. I'm in fact this morning working on a blog post about an author solutions company that not only do you have to give them thirty days notice to terminate but then they can continue to sell your book in any format, in any language, for a year after you terminate. Which, if you're, if you're terminating them because you're moving on to a traditionally published publishing contract, that's going to kill your deal. So yeah. you want to be able to terminate on notice with, in a, in a self-publishing contract and be done. Mm. And that, that's really important because we're not just talking about signing with a traditional publisher. A lot of the, well, all of, you know, publishing on KDP, there's a contract, right? iBooks, there's a contract. There's a contract on every site we publish on. So, yes. and, and including, like you say, Author Solutions companies and other assisted self publishing services have these contracts. But my big point is that um, authors need to remember it's not just one manuscript as such. What you're saying is it can be turned into all of these different things. Correct. Uh, and usually all of that will be in the provision that's titled grant of rights or license. It will have language that will say author hereby grants to publisher exclusive or not exclusive worldwide perpetual royalty bearing la da da rights <laughs> in print, digital, audio, and other formats, whether now existing or created in the future. Many contracts try to capture the the future, every possible reality. Before you sign on that, you need to really understand if that's what you want to give. Yeah. Um, 
and if that makes the most economic sense for you. And that may, it involves taking the time to read the contract. And if you don't understand, reach out to people in your writing group. There are many, many communities have lawyers for the arts that will help you out, uh, particularly if you have a focus question like that on the phone for no charge. It's, you've worked for months, if not years on your book. It's worth investing that, that bit of time and not losing it. Mm. Right, let's move on to the next question I get, which is uh, people wanting to quote things from other books or they want to quote a poem or a song lyric or they want to use somebody's artwork. Um, so tell us a bit about fair use versus breaching copyright versus nightmare scenarios. Okay. Uh, you should always assume that you need permission. And just look for the exceptions beyond that. The exceptions are fair use. If you're using, let's say, a quote um, or a photograph and you're discussing the content of that quote or you're discussing the content of that photograph for commentary, educational purposes, or even to make fun of it, um, a parody, all that is fair use. Uh, if you're using the photograph or the quote merely as decoration or a scene setting, that's not fair use. Uh, this is, there's not a bright line in between those. There's a gray area. It's confusing because the courts are confused. And I think a lot of it's what the judge had for breakfast, as, they, as the joke goes. Um, so if you're... Uh, it's particularly hazardous to use poetry or lyrics. Mm. With lyrics, part of the reason is most uh, music rights are owned by big music companies. They're, they tend to be wanting to squeeze every penny they can out of their work, out of their intellectual property. So they're going to be less flexible than the artists themselves might have been. So the reason why you want, writers often use lyrics in their novels as scene setting because nothing takes you back to a smoky love-in than a song from the 60s. You can't do that without <laughs> risk getting in trouble. You can use the title. You can use the title. You can say the name of the artist. You can describe how the song made you feel. Uh, you might be able to get away with a few words to kind of evoke it. But if you use two or three lines, you're inviting trouble. Mm. With photographs, uh, if before you, I would steer, if you're using on a blog post and you're, it's kind of incidental to a blog post and not terribly commercial, probably no one's going to care. But if you're going to be using an image as your book cover or as a banner of your website or really feature it, uh, do your homework and make sure you can actually use it without getting in trouble. And that homework, actually, I'm going to be coming out with the next week or so with a 99 cent ebook on Amazon that's titled How to Use Eye Catching Images Without Paying a Fortune or a Lawyer. And I, I spell out, and for 99 cents, you know, this is a giveaway as far as I'm concerned. This is, uh, th these are some nuts and bolts information on. What is fair use? What is public domain? And if you have to track somebody down to get their permission, here's how you find them. Mm. And so what about, I, what about Creative Commons? Creative Commons is wonderful. Um, but there are a few tricks, which is if the Creative Commons photograph or image shows a person's recognizable face, or um, somebody else's artwork, like a sculpture or a poster, you don't know whether that photographer got the appropriate release from that model or from the underlying, for the underlying artwork. So if it's a scenery or an animal or a cute little kitten and it's on Creative Commons, go for it. But if it's somebody, you know, it's a pretty girl and you don't know whether that pretty girl signed the right piece of paper, be a little more nervous. 
Mm, and I'm I have my Flickr my Flickr account is Creative Commons, but it's non-commercial. So people can use my photos on their blog posts or you know giving stuff away, but they can't use those photos in their books which they sell. So you can do that, can't you, with Creative Commons? You can actually specify how people can use those works. Yes, in Creative Commons, there's a variety of different. And what the artist does is the artist chooses how their work can be used, and they note it by the uh, an icon that they put on the work. And if you're going to be using a Creative Commons phot photograph, take two minutes and take a look to see whether you're using it in a way that's consistent with how the artist permitted the use, and also to give credit to the artist. If you're using it in your blog post, the best way is you put a little caption uh, naming the original artist who created the image and make that caption a link mm. back to the Flickr photograph, which gives more information about the artist. Yeah, exactly. And I do that on pretty much every blog post um, and link back. And it's, it's great. And, and also, like I, uh, with one of my books with desecration, I found an image on Pinterest, which I really wanted to use, um, but it was copyright. So I got in touch with the artist and said, you know, I would like to use this royalty free, which again is something important. Um, and I didn't, you know, I said, uh, you know, can I use it in my book and, and got her permission and, and she saw it as a marketing exercise. So she was happy to give me permission, you know, as long as I link to her site and in, ev in all the books it gives her links. So there's no harm in asking permission, is there? It's wonderful. It's, we're, we are all a community of creative people and you will find, especially something on Pinterest where People are posting it there. They want to share this with the world. And maybe they'll charge you $50 for it, or maybe not at all. But uh, it's, it's the right way to do it, not just legally, but I think just as being part of the creative community. Mm, no, I agree. Um, so another question I get, another common question is, people who write memoir or nonfiction who are worried about getting sued. So what do you say to those people, and if they insist on going ahead, how can they best protect themselves? This is the most common question I get, and it's the thing that worries writers, but if we didn't write about real people and real events, I think 95% of the books on the market would disappear. So um, that's the good news, is that it is commonly done, and it, it rarely leads to lawsuits. But let me give you, Pete, your, your listeners some idea of the risks. If it's fiction, then mask the revealing characteristics about the person, whether it's physical or uh, their character. It will both give you some more protection, but it may actually free you as a writer if you can you know, make that person look and act a little bit different or blend different people. There have been very few cases where fiction writers have been successfully sued for defamation based upon fictional characters. And where they have is because the writer just wasn't even sensible and really just revealed a best friend's dirtiest and darkest secrets without trying to hide it at all. When you're dealing with memoir and nonfiction, of course, there you, you are, are identifying that person. My general advice is um, remember to show, not tell. Tell, I mean, show what happened, show the scenes, the reactions, your feelings, lay it all out, but avoid attaching labels such as crook idiot, pervert. I mean, there are all kinds of heavy labels out there. Trust that your reader, readers are going to figure that out themselves. If you're worried about privacy issues, uh, any, keep in mind that anything that happens in public, there isn't a right of privacy. This is, I'm talking about the United States. I realize that Britain is different this way. And if there's been a a brutal court battle that's been part of this story, anything that's in public records from the court or testimony in court, in open court, 
you can use that. It's a great source of material. Uh, and then when in doubt, if you really think you're pushing the edge, then hire an attorney and you, he doesn't, he or she doesn't have to read the whole manuscript, but you know, say, focus on specific chapters or how you handle a particular person. Hmm. And uh, can you comment on the UK? Not really, except that, uh, the, that, uh, it's riskier for a writer in the UK. Yeah, we have um, funny libel libel laws here. You do have funny libel laws, but then you also have those really kind of scandalous uh, journals and newspapers. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the constant tension between privacy and the, and the public's thirst for gossip. I, I, it's always going to be a tension and and the courts don't always get it right. Yeah. No, and it, it is interesting. I mean, you know, in my area, in the kind of religious stroke supernatural thriller, I mean, Dan Brown really took off, became a billion dollar bestseller because the Vatican banned his book and reacted so strongly to what was supposedly fiction, you know, but he said, oh, this is based on truth, you know, so sometimes that, that edge, if you're on the right side of that edge, and I don't believe he has been successfully sued, you know, but it, it, that edge can be a good marketing tactic, right? Absolutely. Uh, but it will also be stressful. Yeah. You know, to know. <laughs> But if you're going to just jump out there into the public forum and be controversial, uh, like, for instance, another way to deal with touchy subjects is to use parody. If the story is really exaggerated and can't be true, um, you could actually, I think, be more devastating as a writer um, than, than if you're very truthful. I just think that is an option. If you're going to do really do satire and parody about true events and people go over the top <laughs> yeah. because at least in the United States if something couldn't have been true uh, then it's not defamation the classic case on this is that there was a writer who published an article in Penthouse about 30 years ago about a certain beauty queen whose sexual powers were so powerful that men's entire bodies levitated off the ground. Well, this particular beauty queen sued. And eventually she lost because the court said, while levitation is fascinating, it's not factual. It, does, it can't really have happened. So she ultimately lost the case because it was parody and could not have been the truth. And the whole point of defamation is someone saying is someone is making a statement of fact um, that's damaging to someone's reputation. Well, this was this was a parody that could not have been fact, but probably was still just as damaging to her reputation. Mm. Well, it's so interesting. I, personally, I just steer clear of all of this stuff, but <laughs> but I know some people are very passionate about about doing that. Now, another question. Um, I get is around piracy um, and you know breach of copyright um, what should authors be concerned about when it comes to piracy and can they enforce copyright if they want to, to spend the time it is a time and resource question all of us have limited amount of time and resource particularly if we working in addition to writing and I think there's always going to be some piracy out there. Uh, when I look online, my legal handbook already, there are free PDF downloads available. Uh, yes, I could send what's called a takedown notice. And I would say to your listeners and readers, look up takedown notice and it will take you the details on how to do it. And you could get that site taken down or at least that link to your book taken down. But you could spend a lot of time chasing down these pirates when they really aren't harming you that much because anybody who's downloading a free PDF from them probably was never going to buy your book. Now there can be 
people who are stealing so much from you that it is worth chase, chasing them down. Um, but some of it is just part of being in the business and use your time writing your next book. Mm. But I because, was, yeah, I mean, the, one of the most pirated books is the Harry Potter series, and that hasn't done J.K. Rowling any harm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like richer than the queen. But also, I think, you know, really? as you know, I mean, the more your profile goes up as an author, the more these sites happen. And I used to jump on everything all the time. And, and now I just, I don't even, I don't even bother looking. And I think, I mean, some authors are even using piracy as a marketing kind of yes. way of doing things. So, um, yeah, hopefully people aren't too bothered about that. Now, you, you also have a whole section on uh, watching out for and avoiding scams, which is great in this kind of suddenly shark-infested waters of self-publishing. So, um, without naming any names, obviously, uh, how do indie authors watch out for and avoid these scams? Well, reading the contract is a big one. But even before you do that, there are sites, there are online sites where people try to out um, these, these scams. Uh, writers Beware, um, and I've list some others that are not coming, popping into my head you know, right now. But I would do some searches online and maybe the name of the company or name of the individuals and, and then add scam or complaints to the end of it. Uh, read the contracts. Look for credentials. There are a lot of people out there who are saying, making all kinds of claims about what they can do, the books they can sell, the editing they can do, the contacts. But when you look at their website, they, they have no resume, no credentials, no testimonials. Or if they do have testimonials, you can't find those people anywhere else. Um, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Keep in mind, somebody who's that is it, that successful probably is only working with someone who can only working with people who can pay them a hell of a lot of money. So if they're looking for five hundred or thousand dollar, fifteen hundred dollar contracts, they're small time, and they're not they're not as good as they say they are. Uh, I think that they're particularly go after our older writers who um, are afraid of appearing out of touch and they take advantage of that. They'll do a lot of technical mumbo jumbo and try to intimidate people and take your time. Don't get sold on something really fast. If, take your time to think it through. Don't worry about pleasing the person on the other end of the phone. Step back, ask for advice, do your research before you sign on. Mm. And another thing I've noticed is a lot more competitions which charge entry. And what do you think about those? My rule of thumb is I go to Goodreads, which has a list of contests, and you can link to who won those contests. I haven't checked lately, but if you have a contest, I mean, and I think Goodreads has hundreds of contest lists in. If you go to Goodreads and that contest is not on Goodreads, then it has no prestige. I would, I would not bother with it. If they're charging more than $50, they better be a big prestigious um, organization. Something like Writer's Digest may not be prestigious, but they are big. And I think their entry fees are $100, $90, something like that. There, if you want something from Writer's Digest, you are getting, they know that you, you've bubbled up among a very widespread and large number of competition, competitive books. Um, or just accept the fact that you might win something that you, you know, a prize that you put on your cover. And it's advertising, it's not really prestige. Is the other way to look at it. Yeah, and I worry about the this, you know, a lot of indie authors still want validation from mm -hmm. other than from readers, and they feel like these competitions might give them validation. But as you say, I, I've just noticed so many because I, I mean, I get emails every day from another competition that wants me to advertise them, <laughs> and I'm like, oh. how are there so many of these? It's it's just crazy. Uh. Yeah, I do a list of like 
who's sponsoring it, how long have they been doing it, who links to their site, um, who, is, who are the judges? Are the judges unknown industry experts or do they actually list their judges? I think that's very telling. And, and are those judges you know, New York publishing professionals or just another person with a website who's trying to sell services? Mm. Yeah, we really, really have to be more and more kind of savvy. I feel in this in this industry. So it's you know, and I know you provide a lot of information on your site. So people should definitely check that out. Now, another question: um, collaborations are becoming more and more common these days. And indeed, I have contracts with translators for kind of joint ventures. Um, you know, people do co-writing these days. What are some of the top things to watch out for and make sure you organize if you want to work with other people as an indie? I would start small. I would start with a project. Uh, it's a little bit like romance, a collaboration. There's a bit, uh, there's chemistry and hard work. It, and I actually just did a long post on this and on Joel Freelander's site. Uh, I, I push people to put their collaboration agreement in writing. The process of talking through the issues and writing it down is actually more valuable than anything you put on paper. It just... It, it, you know, it's like a prenuptial agreement for marriage. You know, people say it takes the romance out of it. Well, let's put romance aside and let's think about if you're both going to be committing or more than two of you to a project, what you really want is to get to the end and get to the end successfully. So uh, another, there are a number of things to consider um, and to consider honestly. And, and it almost, we could spend a whole hour talking about those various uh, quirks that make a collaboration work. Mm. But I think, I mean, one of the big things, I think, with anything, like with an agent, I've had a couple of agents, is splitting up that partnership. So, um, you know, with collaboration, it's putting an end date. Like you said about traditional publishers, there's got, you've got to have methods and ways to end things and what happens if things end, right? Yes, that is actually the touchiest thing, is if it doesn't work out, who gets what's left? Yeah. Um, Who gets the copyright? <laughs> yes. Uh, one thing I say to writers is to start off by actually drawing a box and describing what's in the box that you jointly own and what's out of the box that you don't own, that you e each individually own. And, and don't talk about it in vague terms. Make a box on a piece of paper and write down what's in and what's out, and you'll find that exercise incredibly helpful for seeing if you're both on the same page to begin mm. with. Mm. No, I think you're yeah. right. And um, I do do like, I think my translation contracts are a couple of pages and they are just straight sentences of what's happening and who does what and, you know, dates and things like that. And they, it's amazing when you start looking at that box, what's in and what's out of that box, even a basic list can go on for a couple of pages, you know, and, and how you're going to manage things like, like the money, you know, at the end of the day, a collaboration, the money has to go into somebody's bank account. <laughs> yes. And the, the, in the U S and I think Britain's the same, the UK's the same. If you have a collaboration and you don't have it in writing, the law assumes it's a 50-50 collaboration. If it's three of you, it's 33% each. And either one of you, any member of that group, can sell the entire product. They have to share the, the profits, mm. but anybody can sell off what you've created jointly. It's a quirk of the law, but that's what the law is. So one of the things you definitely want to get in writing is an agreement that nobody's going to go out and sell what you create without the consent of everybody in the group. Oh, that's a good one. And, and, and yeah, this is the thing. But what we don't want to do with this chat is kind of scare people off doing these things. I, th I actually think collaboration between creatives is, is the future. I mean, it's very much now, but it, it's the future as well. Um, so don't be scared and, and saying that or not being scared 
people are scared of attorneys like yourself, yes. although you're not scary, you're great. And, but, you know, people are worried that they're going to have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. They're worried that their attorney or their lawyer will just confuse them and that they'll feel stupid. And so how, how do indies, if they want an attorney or a lawyer, how do they find them and how do they work with them successfully? As I mentioned earlier, there are organizations of, of attorneys who donate their time to help artists. Uh, there's a very active one here in California. I know New York has some. And, and so I would start with those organizations because you're getting a self-selected group of attorneys who are interested in, in helping out. And if you have a particular problem that's beyond what they can provide for free, they will have the connections to send you to somebody who is similar, who's a problem solver. The best attorneys, and I think most attorneys are problem solvers. I run into those that who are not problem solvers. They just make problems, try to avoid those attorneys. But so if, if you have to hire an attorney and you can't find one through one of these organizations, then start by asking other writers. And it doesn't have to be writers you know. If you've heard of, an, of a writer who's had a similar problem, contact that writer. Most of us writers, we love to talk. We love to write in emails. We will share information. That's what we do. Uh, if you have an attorney, then it's important to tell the attorney the whole story from your point of view. And then also tell the attorney the story from your opponent's point of view so that the attorney knows much more. You're better off telling the attorney too much information and letting the attorney sort through it for what's relevant than trying to only piece out little bits of information because actually you'll end up with more confusion and spending more time if you do that. Mm. No, I think that's that's good advice, and uh, I have been through a divorce, uh, so that was my only time really with a you know a, a, that kind of legal situation. I've had houses and things, but um, and what was what was it? It was an amicable split. So what we had actually done was create our own checklist of what we wanted to go through and how we would separate and then that the lawyer helped us but it was an interesting process because I remember feeling very worried about talking to this person who I felt had more power and it's interesting because I feel it's almost like the agent relationship and the uh, publisher relationship you feel like this person has more power than you do and you know and I think that's why some people resist going to see a lawyer or even asking a question so I think your book is so helpful and thank you for writing it because clearly you could earn a lot more money not writing books for indies on, <laughs> on law but um, in saying that give us an overview of the things we haven't touched on like what is in the book what will people find in the book I, I walk through, try to walk through the process somewhat sequentially first I try to explain or get the mindset that if you are going into self-publishing, which is what I focused on, you are starting a business. And starting a business involves contracts, money going in and out, um, sales tax, nobody's favorite subject, uh, how to hire freelancers. Uh, I pr look at hiring freelancers and how it's important to get a grant of rights of the work product back to you. Uh, I look at various publishing con self publishing contracts that you'll run into and say explain words like indemnification. <laughs> That's probably the only legal term that I think other than copyright which is very common but the only legal term that's not part of the common vernacular that someone needs to understand. So I go through explaining uh, all of that. Um I I, I, but even though I tried to cover a broad range of topics, I still get questions from people that I hadn't thought of. And, and so I welcome questions. You can either email me, contact me through my website, or post it as a comment on my blog. Because uh, I want to know what's confusing writers out there. Mm. 
Mm. Things I may take for granted because I've been doing this for half my life. Mm. Uh, sometimes someone needs to ask me a question and I pop myself on the head and say, of course I need to explain that. So there's a range of topics, but there's always going to be more to talk about. Mm, yeah, the, the second edition. I'm just doing the second edition of how to market a book, and goodness me, writing nonfiction it just it doesn't stop, does it? <laughs> no, I, it doesn't. Let me see other subjects. Like one thing I talk quite a bit about is that if you set up your self-publishing or freelance writing or traditional writing, and you run it as a business which takes a few steps, for instance, if you have a business name, registering that name, things that will take you an afternoon. If you set up your business correctly, then in the U.S., you're much better, you'll, you have a much stronger argument for deducting your losses, because you will have years in which you lose more money than you make, from other income. But in order to do that, it's called avoiding the hobby loss restrictions. In order to not consider your, for tax reasons, in order for your business not to be considered a hobby, you have to treat it and set it up as a business. And so I do spend some time teaching writers how to do this because it, most of us, this will not be a money-making adventure. It, we're doing it. We hope to break even, maybe make a little bit of money, but most of us are writing because of some other passion we have or some, something we want to say and share to the world. And so we might as well get the IRS sharing in that, right? <laughs> that, no, that's a good perspective because I generally, I always, you know, my goal is, is to be in the top 0.1% of authors who make their living making loads of money writing. <laughs> but I know you're right, most people don't do that. Um. Well, we all hope it's a bestseller. <laughs> and I do believe in planning for success exactly. as a bestseller. But you might as well. Uh, but the other way to look at it is you are investing in a new business. If you're creating a book that's going to sell, you're starting a new business. Just like anybody else is starting a new business. There are tax rules to give people who are starting a new business a break. You should, writers should take advantage of those tax breaks. You are, you are investing time and money into a product and a business, not just a piece of art. And with a little bit of planning and organization, you can take advantage of these tax breaks. Mm. Well, it's a fantastic book and I know, I think everyone should buy it. It's one of those, you know, it might not be so sexy, but it's really important. So, <laughs> so that's fantastic. So where can people find you and your books and your blog online? Uh, the book is available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Uh, the ebook is currently just on Amazon because I'm running some specials on Amazon, and Amazon makes you sign on exclusively with them if you run specials. Uh, my blog is helensedwick.com and then slash blog. But from my website, you can reach my blog. And I am open to, you know, I, I do answer questions that people email me. Uh, I give, you know, the disclaimer is I'm, I'm a, an attorney in California only. So what I'm providing both today and in my email is, is general information that is not legal advice. Um, it's just information, but information and knowledge is what 99% of the time, that's what people need and that's what solves their problem. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Helen. That was brilliant. Thank you. It was fun.